So, just where is Australia's country music capital? Well, up to about 1969, we didn't really have one. And it didn't exist until a couple of DJs and the management of this radio station decided that Tamworth would make a great capital for country music in Australia. And it's been that way ever since. In fact, their decision has created the world's largest country music festival. If you walk out that door Never know for sure Yeah, yeah I'm ready for the indeed John Oxley was the first white man to explore the district. He travelled north from Bathurst and reached this river about 10 kilometres downstream from the present city of Tamworth. He named it the Peel River after the then Chief Secretary of Ireland. Sounding like something out of a real estate brochure, John Oxley's report stated fine waters, good grasses, suitable timber, and not too much of it, it would be impossible to find finer or more luxuriant waters. Nowhere in the world affords the industrious settler more advantages than this extensive vale. In 1850, Tamworth was gazetted and finally became a town. The Tamworth name was taken from a district in Staffordshire, represented by the Right Honourable Robert Peel. He'd left Ireland and gone on to become Prime Minister for England. Tamworth's first mayor was a chap called Philip Gidley King. He was a manager for the Peel River Company, whose origins lay with the Australian Agricultural Company. Back in 1832, they'd been given a massive land grant out here. Over 150,000 hectares was allocated to them. The company had a dominating influence on the early days of the town. This is the townhouse of Philip Gidley King, which provided him with the appropriate residence from which to perform his civic duties. Before his civic and agricultural career began, he'd spent about 10 years at sea, and one of his close friends and companions in those days was the great man, Charles Darwin. And this beautiful early microscope was a gift from Charles Darwin to King as a memento of their times together. What I really like is when a small town has a big plan. In the case of Tamworth, a group of progressive aldermen, led by a fellow called William Joseph Smith, formed the Electric Lighting Committee in 1886. As Smith was so inspired, he went on a journey of discovery to England to further his knowledge. They decided that electric lighting could be provided to a greater area and at less cost than the current gas lighting. So at a grand switch-on ceremony, 17 kilometres of Tamworth streets were electrically lit, making it the first place in the Southern Hemisphere to acquire town-supplied electricity, 16 years ahead of Sydney. And this is what initially powered the system. Demand was intense and soon outstripped the capacity of these old steam engines. In the 1920s, a much larger power station was built. By the 1950s, it was supplying most of the northwest region of New South Wales, confirming Tamworth's reputation as the city of light. What if we fly? What if we soar? What if we touch the sky? What if we fall and find more than we ever had before? What if we find it all? What if we fly? During the Second World War, Tamworth's airport was the second busiest in the country, second only to Sydney. This aeroplane is an Avro Anson. They were used in greater numbers by the RAAF than any other aircraft, especially here at Tamworth. Ah, thank you. There were over 360 RAAF trainee pilots and 80 military aircraft stationed here during that time. See, Tamworth was a good way from the coast, 
And there was a very large army presence here, with over 12,000 soldiers stationed here at any one time. Tamworth's very own airline was to emerge after the war, making good use of the available Avro Anson planes. But in the end, for Tamworth's iconic status, it's all about the music. When television came to the district in the mid-60s, the evening radio audience was decimated. A radio station, 2TM, fought back, launching specialty programs each night. And one of the most successful was the country and western evening called Hoedown. A group at 2TM then conceived an idea. It was to market Tamworth as Australia's centre for country music. Uh, we started running live concerts with people like Tex Morton and Slim Dusty and Reg Lindsay and um, we, we really started promoting co Australian country music which very few other people were doing at that time in Australia and we felt we needed a sort of uh, hero event as they're called these days. We talked to all sorts of people in the music industry and we launched the awards in January 1973. We got tremendous support from the country music industry, but uh, as far as general public was concerned, it was fairly low key. Uh, in those days, there was a bit of stigma about country music. Uh, it was always referred to as country and western, not country as it is these days. But as we developed over the next few years, we used our radio program Hoedown to promote our, our country music awards. So by the late 70s, we were starting to get really big crowds. And we, over a period of 30 years or so, transformed Tamworth from that slumbering, hot country town into a vibrant, active tourist magnet that pulls in people today from all over the world, in fact. Today, the Tamworth Country Music Festival is the largest country music festival in the world, even larger than Nashville's annual gathering. And this is what it's all about. Recent Golden Guitar Award winners include Casey Chambers and Keith Urban, who have made a huge impact on the stage of country music. And they can trace their initial recognition back to moments at this festival. From humble beginnings, Tamworth and the festival have grown to become the heart of country. And the evolution has made sure that Tamworth is now fairly and squarely a great Australian icon town. Sky. What if we fall and find more than we ever 